This is the fourth video in a series where we are rebuilding this transmission for a 1931 Model A. In this video, we will put this transmission together piece by piece. Here are all the parts, many new and rebuilt parts, all cleaned up and ready to go back into the transmission. Before we start, let's make sure we have a crystal clear idea of how things go together. Get a good parts diagram. Do not rely on some goofy old guy you find on YouTube. It is kind of handy that the drain plug in the casting is a three-quarter inch pipe thread. So you can put a three-quarter inch pipe, set it up in the vise, and it's easy to uh, move around during assembly. The snap rings for the two big bearings uh, can just be put in by hand, and you really don't need to take them out. The only reason I took them out is so I could show you how to put them in. This is the reverse idler gear. It goes in first, then slide in the reverse idler gear shaft. There is a cutout near the end of the shaft, and it should be facing the cluster gear shaft. Cluster gear goes on next with two roller bearings and a spacer. Now this shaft and these bearings will be totally submerged in gear oil at the bottom of the transmission casing. Force of habit, I guess. I just cannot assemble anything without the bearings fully greased up. It is a tight fit. Slide the cluster gear into the casing and mesh it with the reverse idler gear. Then slide in the cluster gear shaft. And I put a little grease on the end here just to make sure that that O-ring slides in and does not get damaged. These two cutouts in the shafts should be facing each other so they can accept the retainer plate. I am doing everything I can to try and prevent any oil leaks. And I put sealer tape on this bolt, although sealer tape is designed for pipe threads, not straight threads. And I've had pretty good luck with this. Slide on the shaft retainer and tighten the bolt down. I am putting on the bearing for the main drive shaft, making sure to support the inner race. Slide the bearing into the casting. This is the main drive gear snap ring. And as you can see, it fits in a groove on the main drive gear shaft. Make sure this ring seats properly and that it is tight enough so that it spins with the shaft. This is the retainer for the main drive gear bearing and it locks the outer race to the casting. I put some tacky gasket sealant on both sides of the gasket. This is probably not necessary, but I'm just doing everything I can to prevent oil leaks. Tack up the other side and make sure the drain slot is on the bottom. And the hole for the throw out bearing spring is on the top. Four bolts with lock washers. So far, so good. Here I am putting on the main shaft collar on the main shaft. I used a rubber hammer. Try not to destroy anything. Slide on the main shaft pilot bearing spacer. This is a tight fit. Next goes on the main shaft bearing with a shield. I pressed this on off camera. And finally the roller pilot bearing for the end of the shaft. Oh, wait a minute. You can't put this on quite yet. We have to put the slider gears on first. There you go. That's the way you have to do it. Put the main shaft in the casting, and as it goes in, you put on the slider gears. First and reverse goes on first, then second and high, and make sure the couplings face each other. 
then slide the main shaft into the pilot bearing and the outer race of the main shaft bearing into the casting. Next goes on the main shaft bearing retainer gasket and the main shaft bearing retainer. This locks the outer race to the casting. And make sure the threads for the grease fitting is on the bottom. The bolts for the bearing retainer are expected to have safety wire, so they have holes drilled through the heads. I use 19 gauge, which is 41,000 stainless wire. I'm not going to go through the details here, but when you get done, it ought to look something like this. There are several good YouTube videos on safety wire. Next goes on the universal joint. There is a fine threaded bolt with lock washer, plus a special embossed washer that fits on the front knuckle splines so that it will not spin independently. Slide on the universal joint matching up the splines, then tighten down the bolts. I put the transmission in reverse gear, then slipped in a wooden block to jam up the gear so they wouldn't turn. I can get this universal joint bolt cinched down. The last thing on this side is to put in the oil fill pipe plug and the grease fitting. I plan on filling the oil through the top of the transmission before I put the tower on. Give the transmission a little test run, make sure all the gears are sliding smoothly and engaging properly and that the bearings are operating smoothly. I replaced the old bearings with modern bearings that are sealed on both sides and I chose to remove the inner seal and install the sheet metal baffles. I think you could probably leave the seals in and not use these baffles and everything would be just fine. I also put one of these baffles in backwards and it was binding up one of the bearings so I had to correct that. I just used a clean rag to cover up the transmission waiting for final assembly into the car. Now we can turn our attention to the front bell or clutch housing side. Tack up each cast iron side and then insert the paper gasket. The clutch housing slides on and is secured here by four bolts with lock washers. Put on a little grease and slide on the hub with the clutch release bearing, also called the throwout bearing. And you can see the throwout bearing spring and the grease fittings to be pointed up toward the access port in the bell housing. Before we move on, I wanted to point out that there are two holes in the bell housing that provide room for the shifter shafts as they move into first and third gear. The previous owner did a nice job of fabricating a cover to prevent oil leaks. Now that the transmission case and bell housing are all together, we can install the oil plug ever vigilant about potential oil leaks. Okay, now we can start working on the transmission tower. We will begin with the spring. Only three parts here. This is the spring retainer, which fits on the bottom of the spring. And it also has a cutout in the middle that fits on this boss on the shift lever. So you can see the spring needs to be depressed about half to get this in place. 
I made a tool to help me compress the spring. And as you can see here, it's made out of one and a quarter inch pipe. And I cut about half of it out, maybe six inches long. And welded in two flanges that capture the spring. The flanges are set wide enough so that the shift lever can pass through them, but narrow enough to capture and compress the spring. Here is my setup. The casting is in the vise, and then I've got the shift lever supported so it doesn't move too much. This took me a couple of tries, but I'm going to only show you the successful one. I tried to be as careful as I could. Uh, there's probably about 50 pounds on this spring to get it compressed to the distance you need. Nice. That is the hardest part about assembling this tower. You know, I think this spring is pretty secure in the tool, but I think the next time I use this, I'm going to add a sleeve so that I can make certain that that spring doesn't come flying out of there. These are the remaining parts for the tower with detents in the shifter shafts. The one in the middle is for neutral, first and reverse, second and third. These are the little plungers that fit in the detents on the shaft. They provide the precise location of the forks as each gear is engaged. I am not the greatest welder in the world, but I rebuilt these forks so that they now have the proper half inch clearance and straight sides to engage the rebuilt ball on the end of the shifter. Before we get started, I wanted to point out the clearance that plungers have between the shafts. Here are the two plungers with no spring. So this is the minimum size they'll ever be. They easily fit between two detents on both shafts. And they also fit between one detent and the surface of the shaft. However, they do not fit if you don't have at least one side in one detent. The plungers fit in the casting between the two shafts. Here I am putting in the right shaft. It doesn't matter which one you put in first. And I'm putting the plungers and the spring in place. They fit in a hole in the casting between the shafts. The fork on the right shaft needs to reach backwards and grab the first and reverse slider gear. Now I move the shaft so that the plunger rests in one of the detents. Use a punch to press the plunger and slide in the second shaft. Now the spring-loaded plungers are between the two shafts, and I can slide on the fork which reaches forward to grab the second and third sliding gear. Now I'm going to just locate both shafts in the neutral position. There you go. Here I have just located the rivet pins uh, to hold the forks on temporary from the bottom, just to kind of cycle through the gears, make sure I like how the thing feels. And I like it. You know, most of the tactile feel you get, the tightness of the transmission, how well it cycles, is a result of a well-built tower. Put on the detent screw plug. Not out of sealer tape yet. Put the rivet pins in place by holding the shift fork with a punch and then sliding the pin in from the top. Then you can swedge the bottom of the pin over just to keep it in place. Okay, all done with the tower. Well, that's it for this video. That was actually a lot of fun. Next time, we will put the transmission in the car and the tower goes on after the case is in. If you've made it this far, leave me a comment. I appreciate those.
And next time, we'll put this thing back in the car.